This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to another episode of the Human Action Podcast. Very pleased to be joined this week with an in-studio guest. It's a rarity for me. It's Alan Mendenhall, a name I'm sure some of our Mises Institute readers will know. Alan lives here in Auburn, close to me, so he's able to join us. He is currently one of the deans of the business school at nearby Troy University. Prior to that, he was a dean at Faulkner University and their law school there. And he is known uh, both as a literary person with a PhD uh, across the street at Auburn in English, but also as a lawyer and someone who has uh, worked throughout his career, I guess, in a sense, Alan, maybe straddling the line between philosophy and law and literature and the humanities. So, uh, vis-a-vis my conversation last week with Dan McCarthy, which apparently you got a chance to listen to, I wanted to bring you on to keep talking about this uh, idea of whether intellectualism in, the, in America and in politics and in policy is in big trouble. So all that said, thanks and welcome. Well, thanks for having me here. I thought we were here for the golf episode. <laughs> we got the Masters coming up. Is that is that next week? Well, down here in the South, for those of you who are listening, it appears that March is going out like a lion because it's a raw 50 degree day. But, you know, it really is interesting. Normally, this podcast is all about books. That's what we do. We we read books. And in effect, we sort of review them in podcast format with the goal of either getting people inspired to read more and to maybe tackle the book in question, uh, or if they're not going to tackle it, you know, it's a it's a cliff's note. They can they can learn something about it. And one of the things I discussed with Dan is that, you know, we live in an age where he writes for what I called high tone modern age, an old uh, journal. And here we are at the Mises Institute, among other things, trying to get young people to to tackle 900 page books. And that can be a tough sell. Well, really quickly, before we talk about the anti-intellectualism, I'll tell you a story about books, and it happened last night. Uh, I got a ring on my doorbell, and I was assuming that it was my kid's YouTube video that he was watching. I thought the ring was on the YouTube video. And then finally, I started sort of closing up for the night, locking the door, turning the lights on outside. And I went to the front door and the the window on the door is pretty high up. So we don't have a peephole. So you have to stand up high. So I stood up on my tippy toes to look out the window. And there was another face on the other side of the window. And it took a fraction of a second for me to realize it wasn't my reflection. It was somebody else's face. And when I realized it was someone else's face, I screamed. And then the person on the other side screamed. Well, that person ended up being Joe Becker, the provost of the Mises Institute's new MA program, and he was delivering a book that Mark Thornton had given him to give to me Uh to review for the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. So that was just sort of a funny episode. But at any rate, on to anti-intellectualism, because I think this is a really interesting topic. And I I, I did listen to your show with Dan McCarthy, and I listened to your show with uh, Don Devine, both of whom are, are, are good friends of mine. I see them quite regularly. But I think anti-intellectualism is actually ingrained in the American tradition. And this is not a thought that is unique to me. There is a historian uh, named Richard Hofstetter, and he was a historian most most prominent probably in the 1960s. And he wrote a book called Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, which posited that uh, anti-intellectualism is central to American culture and experience, and that it stems from uh, different strands of Puritanism or uh, Protestantism that uh, abandon history and biblical exegesis in favor of personal revelation or emotion or charisma. And he said democracy itself encouraged governance by the non-thinking people, by the masses, by the untutored. And he he, he cited uh, Jacksonian democracy. And, uh, and he suggested that the the sort of the, the the business and commerce of the American way made us all so busy that that uh, we didn't have time for reflection and study and so he suggested that it's sort of just central to America to be uh, anti intellectual I, I I think that maybe anti intellectual intellectualism is is maybe not the right word because that suggests a sort of like hostility mm-hmm. toward people who are intellectuals or who spend their time thinking about big ideas. But I think the the bigger problem is pseudo-intellectualism, that there are too many people who 
believe they know a lot of stuff when they in fact do not. Everybody seems to think that they're an expert these days. It doesn't take very long uh, scrolling through a Facebook feed to see how many people are voicing uh, opinions with with such certitude about things that sometimes people who are familiar with the subject can look at it and say, "Well, that, that does, that's not right." You know, why is that person so adamant about this one thing? But at any rate, I, I wonder almost if if, if pseudo intellectualism is is uh, more of a problem. People who are claiming knowledge and proficiency in some field uh, in which they actually lack knowledge and proficiency. Um, so that's that's one possibility. Well, I wonder, relative to other periods in American history, are we really more hostile to intellectualism? But but a little deeper, are we poorly read? I have had a professor who teaches at a big SEC school. It's not Auburn. I won't say the school. And he suggested to me that the majority of his freshmen, he thinks, have perhaps never read a book. Wow. Yeah. I, and I'm not surprised. So- Surprised by that. I mean, you can go through an English department. So I have a PhD in English. You can go through and get a PhD in English these days without having to take a course on Shakespeare. And that to me is is amazing. Um, I, I don't know if you recall this book. It was published in 1985. And a, a guy named Neil Postman wrote uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And it, it actually holds weight today. So he suggested that rather than an Orwellian future with an overwhelming oppressive government, constantly surveilling us, the future was that of, of of Huxley's Brave New World, in which people have come to love their oppression. They actually fall in love with it, that they, they, they are uh, amused and entertained. So just as we are today by like the technology that is bound up uh, with with government, as much with government as, as with business, um, under, under the Orwellian scheme, you have this big brother and the Ministry of Truth and books are banned. But under H- the Huxley scheme, no one wants to read books anyway because they're mm-hmm. so uh, content at being distracted and entertained that they have no need for books. So they've been conditioned into this, I, I guess you could call it anti-intellectual state, but non-intellectual state might be a, a better word for it. So I think Neil Postman's idea was that technology per se isn't bad, but its use uh, to distract us with uh, infotainment, to give our minds a break rather than exercising them with mental challenges and work has led us to be content and complacent in our mindlessness. We've been seduced by trivia into into docile and unserious uh, automatons, basically. Well, there's probably a lot of truth to that. And I'm sure in terms of deep reading and deep thought, the radio probably challenged that. The television certainly yeah. challenged that. I'm sure people lamented the end of, of serious reading. And of course, now the digital world, which I, I would draw a line between just the original world of the internet and now social media, I think is a whole new factor. And there is a sense, and I hope it's wrong. I hope this sense is incorrect, but there's a sense that we are sort of pinging around so much now between so much white noise that we can't think very well or focus very well. Yeah, and I I, I tend to agree with that. So I know before we were uh, on the show, we were talking about sort of canons and uh, and you know curricula in which certain texts must be read in order to acquire literacy or to be sort of initiated into the discourse and to become a learned person or something like that. Well, I do think we are just inundated with information. And that goes right down to, I mean, we could say that it's, it, you know, that that's something that happens in the curriculum at the level of the canon where now everyone's trying to introduce marginalized voices or, or uh, underappreciated people and texts that are incorporated from other cultures. And now it's hard to have a canon because you all you know, have all that sort of information overload. But then there's information overload just in the sense that, I mean, I just flew back from from Dallas, Texas, and I'm getting on the plane to try to pick a movie and there are a lot of choices. And uh, I don't think that it's, you know, a tyranny of options is necessarily a bad thing. But what my choices involve, you know, I wanted to watch the news and I'm having to make decisions based on, okay, well, do I do I put on Fox News or are all these people around me going to carry all these assumptions about who I am as a person? So do I watch CNN? No, I can't possibly bring myself to, to do that. So what do I do? So I've, I finally set on ESPN and I'm watching, you know, some rerun of, I don't even know, some basketball game from the 70s. And it was actually more interesting than I thought it would be. But at any rate, we have this information overload. We're constantly 
uh, inundated by uh, by uh, by entertainment, and uh, and entertainment is good. I know Paul Cantor would, would you know I could see him rolling his eyes at me right now because he likes to point out you know the serial serialized novel was at one point lowbrow and mm-hmm. people disdained it and thought well that's that's for unserious. Uh, readers, you know, reading novels that well, I'm above reading novels. Poetry is a supreme form of art. And and what do we do now? We, we've we canonized all these novels and now novels are too hard for us. And so maybe maybe film will be like that or maybe television shows will be like that for us one day. And we're, you know, we're just not appreciating the virtues of commerce involved in that process because we're so immersed in our own moment. Maybe. I don't know. Um, but uh, But I do think that just – the sheer difficulty involved. I mean, in in watching something purely visual, in which the imagination does not have to be exercised because the images are already there, and I just think there's just more of a leap. There's more work to be done when you're reading, not only not only exercising the ma- the imagination and 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 uh, and coming up with images to represent this world that is coming to life in text. But also just at the level of, of vocabulary and dealing with um, arguments, you know, it's 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 difficult to uh, watch television for philosophy. For example, you can you can watch a show and you can follow a plot, but you know, am I going to go watch? I don't know. Uh, law legislation, the equivalent of Hayek's three volumes of law legislation and liberty on television. I don't think there's nothing like that to, mm-hmm. to, to sort of give. And there were some highbrow shows for a long time. I mean, even mm-hmm. even what was the what was the McLaughlin group? You know, even that was a lot mm-hmm. more uh, highbrow and and uh, difficult than what you get now, which is basically really attractive people, scantily dressed, talking at a surface level about mm-hmm. some. Very fleeting mm-hmm. political issue. Well, I would say moderately attractive people <laughs> in some cases, but no. If you go back and look at Firing Line, for example, yeah, Firing and then Line. endure a Fox News segment today. Um, but a lot of this, I know, it's easy to fall into this idea of like Clint Eastwood, get off my lawn, or we're sitting here saying kids these days. Right. But I really think this is different. I think something has changed uh, uh, quantitatively. Um, you know, this this really is different. When we have smartphones, when our kids are bombarded with basically limitless information at their fingertips f- for free or no additional marginal cost, I, I think th- there's a profound shift happening. And I, I think it's damaging our ability to do real deep intellectual work. Well, I think so too. I mean, you know, our presidential debates aren't like the Lincoln-Douglas oh. debates. You know, it's more like a Super Bowl or WWE entertainment orgy. Uh, but, you know, more people today are receiving an education, but the quality of the education does seem to have diminished. And it does have uh, a, a direct impact, I think, on issues of of class and inequality and all these kinds of things in America. I think about Tyler Cowen's book from a few years ago, The Complacent Ca- uh, Class, that was um, arguing about how Americans are self-segregating by income and by education and by race and and all these kinds of things. And then uh, Charles Murray's coming apart from, uh, I don't know, maybe almost 10 years ago now, I think, uh, talking about the fragmentation of, of, of white Americans as they divided into cultures that he said were represented by Fishtown on the one hand. That was kind of the, the struggling, more conservative, blue-collar underclass. And then the Belmont, which was sort of the elite liberal – um, upper class and and uh, so it's not just that that people are are getting more education and not getting more out of it, but the credentialism has gotten a, a little bit out of control. And there's so much uh, difference between graduating, say, from a Northeast college or an Ivy League school and going into you know business or industry or whatever it is. I mean, the networks are just so incredible for for a graduate of, of one of those institutions, and somebody who may be getting uh, an equal education, or at least studying under professors who went to those same institutions, but is not uh, you know sort of graduating into the same networks. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, so uh, you know, I don't know quite what to make of this. I'm not even sure what point I'm trying trying to make, other than to suggest that. 
you know, the way we educate and uh, the the purpose of higher education today is really in flux. I think we're going to see a lot of changes in higher ed. We've got over $1.5 trillion in student loan debt. So something's got to give, you know, we've got declining birth rates. We're not going to be able to repopulate these classes uh, with or these institutions with people and these dorm rooms with people. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in, uh, in higher ed in the next, say, decade. But that's another matter altogether. Well, Charles Murray, for example, you mentioned him, thinks a, a lot fewer people ought to go even to undergraduate school. In other words, that ought to be for sort of the cognitively top kids. And I remember speaking with Michael Rechtenwald about this, you know, and we were both trying to defend the idea of a liberal arts education that it, an educated person, yeah. let's say someone comes, our example is someone comes out of Wharton School of Business, they're a brilliant quant, they go work in an investment bank, make tons of money. But they know nothing about poetry or literature or World War II or classics or mythology or Greek or Latin. And, you know, they're not truly an educated person in the old-fashioned sense of the word. But the flip side is that it's only, let's say, in the last 50 years or so, maybe even 30 years, where average people have gone to undergraduate and sought what we, I guess, could call a liberal arts education. Because it used to be that if you were wealthy, you could do that. You could spend a few years just learning almost for learning's sake. But if you weren't wealthy, you needed to develop a trade. And we seem to have lost that. Yeah, no, I I agree. And some of that is a loss internally. So for example, I'll take an English department just as a representative example, since I went through an English department and got a PhD in English. Well, to be a literate person necessarily requires quite a bit of leisure. Like reading is not hard manual labor and English departments do not like to think of themselves as being elitist or upper class. You know, they're they're very uh, egalitarian and, and progressive and they want to uh, reach uh, communities and, and, you know, and improve poverty. All this. So so there's been a, a lot of cognitive dissonance in, in how to how to uh, market an English degree. That you can't. You'll see people talking about you know the skills you learn and reading and writing and these sorts of things, but you're not going to see them talk a whole lot anymore about uh, learning for learning's sake. And you certainly wouldn't see them suggest that that you are going there for Sophia, for wisdom, for for you know some sort of higher purpose like that. Um, you mentioned canons earlier. I do want to say one kind of thing ab- about that, that. That I I was thinking about this as I was driving here um, from from Troy. And I sometimes wonder if the the content or substance of a canon is in some ways less important than the fact that there is one. Um, and what I mean by that is that people behave and communicate better when they have a shared set of text around which to orient their culture and their vocabulary and their discourse. And so the uh, the messages and values you get from a canon of text are complicated. They're competing. They're confusing. If you look at just Harold Bloom's list of the Western canon, it's hard to it's hard to take. Oh well, here's a message I can derive from that because the texts are all over the place, and some of them have some messages that may seem amoral or anti moral. So uh, what matters? I, I I sometimes wonder, and I'm not totally convinced. It's just a speculation. What matters is that people have a common reference point to ground their conversations about morality or philosophy or politics. And what we have now is such fragmentation, such fracture, that people don't have shared traditions. And so not only in the political realm are people sort of siloing themselves off and listening to only their media network of choice and not hearing the other side, but they don't even have a culture common reference point. They they can't even uh, speak about we talked about Shakespeare earlier. They can't they can't contextualize Lear in some sort of contemporary political context or something like that. You know, we just we we almost can't speak to each other in in a deep cultural way because we've got so many different cultures moving so many different directions. Which it would be an interesting uh, segue into the the. The, the talk you had with uh, Dan McCarthy about nationalism and, and what that means because, you know, I, I remember you saying at some point that there could be nations within nations and that, that, that's absolutely correct. Right. But at some point there's a difference between saying, hey, I'm not interested in Shakespeare. I don't really want to study Shakespeare. I'm not going to study Shakespeare and just outright hostility. We shouldn't study Shakespeare He's a dead white male, et cetera. And that's, I think, a very dangerous tone to have in a society because this is the basically the critique of both Don Devine and uh, Dan McCarthy of what we might call libertarian liberalism right. is that it doesn't hold. 
um, you know, it, it invites factionalism. Well, and those who angrily condemn history risk being condemned by what will become history. I always encourage my students when they're looking at the past to give historical figures the same treatment that they would like to be given <laughs> in some future state because it's clear every period of human history involves some convention, some thing that everyone's doing that we now look at as wrong. You know, they, they did something that was wrong or that was stupid or whatever. Well, that means that we're doing something too. And maybe we're so immersed in our moment that we we don't know what it is. But somebody a few hundred years from now is. And I sure hope that they're going to be charitable towards us in the way that we ought to be towards people who were trying to get it right and just weren't. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that the past is devoid. Except the past is actually full of really useful stuff and, and it's full of, of, of things that people got right. In fact, if people hadn't gotten so many things right, we wouldn't have the prosperity and all the other things that we enjoy today. So, you know, it's just a very dangerous exercise to, contem to just condemn the past. I mean, as far as um, intellectuals go, I think the posture for a true intellectual has got to be uh, humility and tolerance and suspension of judgment. Rather than being you know, anxious to form an opinion, you should suspend judgment and hold on to that opinion until you have considered all angles and you've really read deeply and widely and spent a lot of time uh, and, and, and the primary texts, and then a lot of time in the secondary texts, and you've looked at sort of the genealogy of uh, histor you know, the historiography and, and how, how different people have been treating that, that text or that figure over long periods of time because you know, there, are, there are different periods of history, like as historiography. There's you know, the, the period in which somebody thought the Enlightenment was this, or the, then mm -hmm. the Enlightenment was that, and then you know, and, and it, that, that changes uh, our perception of what that historical moment said. Just, you, we'll just say it's the Enlightenment for, for purposes of this segment. But the perception of what that moment stood for, or whether it was good or whether it was bad or whether it was flawed, changes over time. And so we have to be aware of that or else, you know, we're just setting ourselves up for our, you know, for our own eventual failure, our own mocking by some future generation. Well, some of the circles you travel in, for instance, the Federalist Society, uh, you've, you've lectured up at Hillsdale, uh, at the uh, Philadelphia Society, for example, at Acton, the Mises Institute, you're involved with us as well. So, you know, with Pete, with our listeners understanding sort of, you know, your background, what are, what are, what are some of the books or some of the people, the thinkers you wish people in our circles were reading or reading better? Well, I actually get asked this a lot. So I finally scanned the end of Harold Bloom's The Western Canon, where he actually lists all the essential texts and put that in a PDF, and I just have it on my desktop. So that whenever someone asks me that, mm -hmm. I copy it and just put it in and say, here's here's a list. And, you know, it's a difficult list to get through in one lifetime. I remember in 2017, maybe 16, I, I set up this reading list, and I was going to read one major text from the Western canon every week that I had not read before. Okay. And then by the end of the year, I had all this anxiety because I realized, oh, there are not that many books on this list. Like, if you want to read all these great texts in the Western canon, you need more than one lifetime, which means I'm going to die not reading a lot of books that I really would like to read before I die, but it's just not going to happen. There's just not enough time. But, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, so the answer to your question is everything in, the, in that appendix of, of Harold Bloom's The Western Canon. But, uh, but Ed Hirsch, E.D. Hirsch uh, Jr. had the book called Cultural Literacy, Literacy that came out in 1988. And it it would composed a list of people and references that every literate, ed educated American needs to know um, to ensure that we're making the best and most informed decisions based on the higher, highest levels of discourse and communication. And uh, I think a lot of the references in that in that book still hold, and that it's worth you know picking up and and flipping through to see you know how well you do. Like how, you know, it's fun to pick it up yeah. because you would think it would be dated. 1988 was a pretty long time ago. And uh, but but so many of those cultural refer references. Well, you know, it's and it's short paragraphs. Yeah. On, on the various subjects. My uncle bought me that book. I was a teenager. Yeah. 
And I ha- I still have that at home. It's sort of like a dictionary. It's a hardcover. And it's still selling. Yeah. I went on Amazon like not that long ago, and it appears to be selling selling a lot of copies still. So it's held up fairly well. Well, sometimes we tend to have a little bit of a dismissive attitude towards academics. You know, as you mentioned earlier, you, you know, you're not digging ditches. But real academic work, the kind where you are trying to advance the literature, let's say, in a particular area, where you are reading all the background sources, where you're heavily annotating and footnoting your arguments. I mean, that's actually grueling, rigorous work. It's labor. It's, it's absolute labor. It takes a lot of time. People spend hours in archives. And uh, history isn't just a collection of facts about the past, but it's a series of questions about human events, affairs, and ideas, and the narratives we tell about them. So... It, it you know it's not just like you're memorizing a bunch of uh, dates or something like mm-hmm. that. You are making arguments, which means to do it the right way, you have to immerse yourself in a long line of thinkers so that you are engaged in the right conversation. Right? You don't want to just jump in and share some opinion, be like, oh yeah, well you know four decades ago everyone thought that, so you know you're kind of late to the game. You know we've 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 this conversation has advanced way beyond that. So. You've got to read a ton just to insert yourself into the conversation, which is why, you know, it, 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 it's why, frankly, young, young people aren't really equipped yet to, to get into those conversations at the level of depth uh, that is required. And it's just because they haven't been alive young and long enough. You know, it's not their fault. It's just, you, you know, it takes a lot of time to read a lot of stuff. And so, you know, it, it requires dec- decades of work. I mean, it's a lifetime project to try to master a field and um you know there are some people that are just uh, really amazing the and human can, action podcast uh, field is available on itunes like soundcloud stitcher world, spotify example. google those, play those, you know, and on mises.org really, really subscribe to get new and, episodes uh, every week and find and more content like this on mises.org ready for that but they, most people also think that they are and so that you see a lot of people arguing um, again, on social media with uh, with with such uh, hatred, really, with such hatred of their interlocutors and, and opponents. And that, that hatred is just not earned yet. You know, that contempt right, is not, not warranted. Earned. You're, it's not, you're warranted. not oppressed. Right. It's not. A, yeah, that's exactly right. Well, I do think that we were not meant to share our inner thoughts with the world. In other words, when you sit down on an airplane the other day. Just an unmediated yes, thought, right? Without yeah. any filter and just just tweet about the heavy set person next to you eating their sandwich loudly or something like that. That's a private thought. Right. And I think that there's part of the human <laughs> human interaction, uh, you know, we ought to keep that private. Well, and I you know, it's it's funny that you say that because uh, you know, you, you you look at all these these novels, or excuse me, these uh, uh, biographies coming out of it. For example, there's one out now about Philip Roth and talking about all these sort of uh, libido <laughs> uh, problems in his life and things like that. And, and people didn't know about him at, during his life, and it was because you know, the, people respected their other people's privacy a little more, but also people respected their own privacy. You know, they didn't just tweet out every every thought in an unmediated you know an unmediated way and and I say this as someone who's just as guilty as everyone else I mean I I live in our own cultural moment too but uh but you know I wonder what what you know it will be interesting when historians look at our age because they'll go through all these ages where it was hard to find out details about it and then they'll get to our age and like wow we know Everything about this person, absolutely everything, especially if they're able to like do some kind of forensic science on our laptops and cell phones and go see like yeah. what we Google in our private moments, you know, our most private moments. And people can learn an awful lot. I, like, you wonder what what's going to happen if uh, people could get access to you know, Joe Biden's iPhone. What does he Google, you know, on there? What does he search? I mean, presumably that information is available somewhere to somebody, but when will researchers be able to figure out how to get that? Or will they ever? Is that stuff just destroyed? I don't know. Well, that's how the CIA and NSA keep him in line. Yeah, no doubt. That's but, right. you know, I, I want to wrap up this conversation by talking about the connection between reading and writing. Yeah. Now, you mentioned David Gordon earlier. He literally reads about two books and reviews them per week yeah. for us at the Mises Institute. So if you just go to our site, Mises.org, type in David Gordon, you can see more book reviews. Just absolutely unbelievable, his output. But he's obviously a very special person with a special mind. I, I want to defend English majors. Uh, I'm an English major in undergrad. 
here's what it made me do. It made me write a lot of 10 page papers on a deadline. Right. And those papers were graded harshly back then, you know, both stylistically and grammatically by my professors. And I've spent uh, a lot of my uh, working life in law and accounting firms, and I've corrected a lot of bad 20-something writing. So I would argue that just like if you can be really good at Excel spreadsheets, that's a, a skill coming out of school that you could offer an employer. If you're a good writer, a good editor, uh, I think that's rare today. I totally agree with that. And just communicator in general, somebody that understands manners and, and, and is able to con convey opinions in sort of a, uh, a polite way. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure you, as, as president of the Mises Institute, get numerous emails that just begin, hey, Jeff, blah, 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 blah. You know, and you know, it's someone you've never even seen before. You don't even know the person. But, sure. you know, the, so, you know, just just a you know, old fashioned sense of decorum, Jeff, would be would go a long way. But, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, English majors, uh, they do read and write a lot. And uh, and they are subject to constant grading of papers because, you, you know, the principal mode of grading uh, for English majors is papers, you know, mm -hmm. is, is, you know, revising and editing a, a paper. So you're right. Uh, and uh, the more you do that, the, the better. And even in law school, I, I noticed that people who were English majors were not so phased by the amount of reading they had to do or, for example, in legal research and writing, they weren't as daunted as maybe like, I don't know, someone who majored in some kind of hard science or something um, who wasn't used to writing a lot. Um, you know, they say lawyers read and write more than any novelist. I don't know. That's just a saying. I don't know that there's anything you know, quantitatively true about it. But uh, but at any rate, someone who's an, an English major will be you know equipped for law school, which requires a lot of reading and writing. Um, maybe not so much on the argumentation these days. I find that that sort of the <laughs> the, the logic and reasoning going on in uh, English departments has sort of fallen by the wayside. But uh, but we'll see. Maybe there's hope for recovery. Well, I certainly hope that the listeners of this podcast and fans of the Mises Institute in general are out there interested in intellectual life and reading a lot and attempting to better themselves and, and attempting also to just shut down the mind a little bit, turn off some of this white noise and allow yourself to read maybe older literature, maybe economics, which already exists. And the one thing we can all do to make the world a better place, I think, is if to the extent we know young people, we can get them started uh, on this lifetime's worth of reading that Alan mentioned earlier rather than later because it's a big boost if you don't have to start, uh, you know, reading uh, Greek philosophy when you're 30. If you're doing that when you're 14, uh, you're going to be a lot further along. So all that said, Alan Mendenhall, if you follow him on Twitter, you'll get uh, his sort of literary recommendations each and every day. Uh, find him, Alan Mendenhall, on Twitter. And I want to thank you, Alan, for your time today. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.